Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Rabbit Dog's House, where we like to discuss lost or forgotten horror gems with a little bit of bite. I'm your host, Justin Steele, and tonight we are going to discuss 1986's Extremities. Directed by Robert M. Young and starring Farrah Fawcett, James Russo, Diana Scarwood, and Alfre Woodard. After working late one evening, Marjorie is attacked by a masked man hiding in the back seat of her car. After narrowly escaping, she finds little relief as the police can do nothing to help her and the man has all the information he needs to find her again. Marjorie receives comfort from her roommates Pat and Terry, however, her terror-filled nights are followed by paranoid days waiting for her attacker to strike again. Adapted from the shocking stage play written by William Master Simone, Extremities is an 80s thriller that examines what one is willing to do when faced with paralyzing fear and how strong someone is capable of being when taking back their power. Extremities is for the horror fan that enjoys an 80s thriller with adult themes and tough issues still being faced today in today's culture. Also joining me tonight is my amazing co-host, Zena Dixon. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us for another episode of the Rabbit Dog's House. Thank you, Zena Dixon, the real queen of horror, for joining us tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing so great. How are you? I was going to say something cooler, but nothing yeah, came to mind. I'm trying to think of something cool to kind of say, too, and I'm like, I'm going to say it. But uh, I am excited. Uh, we're going to talk about 1986's Extremities tonight, a uh, thriller. Um, you know, a movie that came out at the time of, you know, the heyday of 80s slashers. We kind of have an alternative choice here with a thriller based on a, a stage play. Um, it was a hit on Broadway or off Broadway, um, starring originally Susan Sarandon. Then Farrah Fawcett took over the role. And wow. these actors and actresses, you know, this is a, there's a lot of, it's not a graphic movie, but there's definitely a lot of violence and adult yeah. themes. I believe the stage play starts right at the moment where Marjorie's alone in the house, played by Farrah Fawcett. James mm-hmm. Russo, Joe, if you will, comes into the house and they have their dynamic right from there. That's where the play begins, where the film, I believe, added the whole intro, which I love the intro uh, because I think it really adds another layer of fear to the movie, a little extra mm-hmm. terror, the idea that like, Somebody can be attacked, get away, but they don't really get away because the person has all their information. I think that's a really scary concept, you know? But overall, you know, this is an adult thriller. It definitely tackles, you know, in the horror tradition of like, I spit on your grave or last house on the left, the topic of rape and revenge. But also, you know, this one's definitely not as graphic. However, it's just as heavy a topic. It's just as in your face. It's just as traumatic. Uh, but again, it's it's a little bit of a different choice for maybe what was coming out at the time. You had right. all these 80s slashers, et cetera. And I, we, we've discussed this on the show all the time. We love a good thriller. We love a good 90s thriller, 80s thriller. Uh, I first came into this movie, I'm pretty sure I was a kid. I was the youngest of my, you know, brothers. So I remember my parents telling me, you know, Justin, don't watch or go out of the room. The rules were a little more relaxed for me, though. So I'm pretty sure I snuck back in. Had no idea <laughs> what was going on. But I was telling you beforehand, before we started filming, that I'm pretty sure this movie is a contributing factor of me growing up to be a feminist or making sure to always try and treat women right. Because the I understood even at a young age seeing this, which I probably shouldn't, but shouldn't have seen it. But knowing at a young age, you can't treat somebody like this, another, a woman like this. I, I just, it, it got into my bones, this movie. And it wasn't so much later that I watched it, but I love, I really have come to love this movie. I love the feel of it. It does, even though it's not an 80s slasher, it sort of opens as an 80s slasher where you're in the POV of this predator or villain. You know, he's stalking these women. You have, uh, everything unfolds the way it does, but you have these strong women and I love that each and every one of them at some point even though it's in relation to this rapist uh all these women get a chance to shine in the film from Marjorie to Pat to Terry I think even though these women are very different you can kind of understand how they ended up as roommates you can see that they care for each other and their friendship and relate their friendship 
and roommate relationship is definitely tested over the course of this film. However, I think it's genuine, and I love that each woman gets to shine. Again, for those watching right now, we're doing a non-spoiler review. We're going to do some spoilers here shortly. But I just will say, I think this is a great movie for those that love the feel of maybe an 80s slasher, but maybe more of a thriller, would like to, you know, a movie that makes you kind of think it definitely is going to be, it's polarizing. People are going to kind of love it or hate it, 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 it but it forces you to think. But Zena, how did you, um, what did you end up thinking about it? I know you said maybe you saw it when you were younger and now you've seen it mm -hmm. again. What, what are your thoughts on Extremities? Well, okay, it's similar to your background, like we was kind of talking before we started recording, and I remember bits and pieces of this movie as a kid, but, you know, and I we talked about this before, how my mom is a huge horror fan, not saying that this is a horror, but, you know, she didn't want me watching it, you know, and I, you know, I kind of felt left out because all my brothers and sisters, they were in the room, my dad was in the room, everybody except me, and it's just like, oh, you can't watch this, and it's just like, well, why? Especially because, like you said, it's not graphic. It's brutal, you know, the yeah. thought of it, there's some disgusting behavior, disgusting language, uh, which we'll get more into the behavior with certain people. And it's not always who you think it is. You know what I mean? Like you expect it from this particular character, but you get it from outside of that. But yeah, point is that there was the, the scene that I remember, um, you know, when I, when I rewatched it earlier this week is when she was in the car, the character Marjorie in the car, which we'll get into that. So that's the scene that stood out. But I really enjoyed this movie. Like you, I feel like from the start, there's just something about that beginning that sets the tone. You know, there's nothing fun and there's no fun and games about this movie. Even though it's like, okay, it's dated, you know, you can tell by the clothes and the hair, but it's just kind of like some of the things that, that just happened to this woman. And it's just like, okay, why is it no one listening to her? including other women, which is what I found insane, you know? And so it's just like, why would she lie? She doesn't have a reason to lie, you know? And then on top of that, you know, like you said, around this time, this is when we were getting a lot of slashers, a lot of brutal slashers, but this one, I don't think that it's brutal, but it, it, it does something mentally to you, you know? It's just upsetting. It, you don't have to be a woman to get upset with this movie, you know? So that's something I really love about it. And Farrah Fawcett, wow, like her acting is amazing. And I don't think I've ever seen her act this well that I could think of at the moment, you know? So, but yeah, of course we'll go into like other characters and, and, and actors and everything like that. But I really enjoy this movie. Again, I feel like it's a very serious tone thriller. When, this, when, it, when it ended, I wanted more. No, I want to see what happens. You know, yeah. I need that satisfaction, you know? And so, I, but I love the fact that this, you know, watching this, of course you felt for the character or, you know, certain cat, well, felt for the character. But then on top of that, you, obviously you cared, but you feel very much invested. And I found myself getting upset for her. And I don't really feel like she did anything, you know what I mean? That was horrible to put herself out there, that she did anything dumb. I mean, she was literally fighting for her life, you know, against just an awful big fat liar. <laughs> like, so, but yeah, I, wow. Like I really enjoyed it. And, but like you though, again, as a kid, I remember when I saw that particular scene when she's in the car and uh, the main character, Margie and Joe has the knife up to her throat. It was just kind of like, oh, okay. You know, like, cause I watched horror. It's like something I've seen before, but my mother was just set on me not watching this at all you know and i was really i have no idea how old i was i was really young and um yeah i remember i, I left and then when i start the when i started the movie earlier this week again just go back with the beginning i love the opening the music you know we see this character on a motorcycle and then just the title comes up it's, it's just simple it's straightforward a really great like intro and a great movie overall well, I'm really glad to hear, you know, your opinion on a voice on it. I've wanted to I've wanted to do a review of this movie for a really long time, and I'm glad I get to do it, do this review with you. Um, I you know, I couldn't agree more. And from here on out, spoilers, spoilers, yes. spoilers. <laughs> but um, yeah, it is an upsetting movie. I'm glad you used the word upsetting. I was struggling to find that. I think it's interesting though, for the same reasons, 
I feel like my my parents or my brothers, I was able to get away watching violence more than I was allowed to watch sex or, you know, like anything that's like, and I feel like a lot of people within our general age range, mm -hmm. that's, that's the case. It's something yeah. about American society or, you know, society as a general that it's like, oh, it's okay if a kid sees these these people being blown up, shot, explosions, but a woman, you know, anything of a sexual nature, close mm -hmm. your eyes, close your eyes. And really, luckily, you know, Marjorie, she doesn't get raped in the movie. It's so yeah. close and it's, you know, it's a, it's a double edge. And like I, I think I said earlier, you know, based on the play, the play begins a little bit further in. It begins with like the, the first real, or the second confrontation begins. But the, the movie added on this entire preamble of she you get to see a little bit more of Marjorie's life. She works at a museum. And yes, Farrah Fawcett's performance is great. You know, Farrah Fawcett before this was known for Charlie's Angels and then a few like Lifetime movies. And I also wanted you to see this movie because I know you and I love a good Lifetime movie. Yeah. It's not a Lifetime movie, but it definitely has that certain quality to it at the same right. time you know a woman struggling against you know these men in her life or domestic abuse or you know a lot of what a lot of lifetime creations are this is almost a preamble to, to what was going to be the 90s lifetime movies and i like that you know we get to see farrah fawcett with a more um relatable role she was nominated for a golden globe for a performance in this and she Really, you get to see this woman who's just living her life, just wants a quick ice cream cone after work. I love the music in this too, both the, yeah. the sound or like the score, as well as I think they're playing Spanish Eddie when she goes up to the uh, to the ice cream store, which is just this 80s song that I always loved. The, the song, I the version I knew was by uh, Laura Branigan, who did like Gloria and stuff like that. But so it's like this upbeat music playing, but you, mm -hmm. you know you're in the eyes the POV of this killer predator. Uh, you don't know anything about him yet, but you see him like creeping up onto one woman, but her husband's there, so he backs off. Then he yeah. starts targeting in on this other woman, young girl walking with her ice cream cone. But then just as he's about to pounce, Marjorie pulls up, she runs to get her ice cream cone, and then bam, there he is. And you feel her helplessness as she is, these three guys get out of this car and she wants to yell to help, but she doesn't because the knife is, at her throat but i love that whole almost slasher opening where yeah. then they're under the highway it's terrifying what do you do in that situation right. what do you do and she manages to get away and you you know i'm definitely when i watch movies i get pumped up where i'm like run yeah, yeah you know that's you exactly how it was. <laughs> oh. and so when she gets away but then even at the police station disappointing there's nothing they can do this guy comes in mistaking her as a prostitute exactly. and like, yeah, I think that's so like telling of even though this is an 80s movie, we're still dealing with these issues today. There's, you know, and it's it's bare, it's like maybe 0.05% better, if not 20% worse now. Like it's this pendulum that's like swinging out of control. And right. the fact that this movie was spot on at the time, she's helpless. She's helpless to have anybody help her. Her roommates, I love that, you know, again, Patty and Terry. Uh, played by Diana Scarwood, who I'll always love for Monty Dearest, but she was also in Psycho 3. She was yeah. in What Lies Beneath. I just I just love Diana Scarwood. And I always say her name, I always want to say Alfred Woodward, but it's Alfred <laughs> Woodard. Woodard. And yeah. I love her too. I mean, she went on to do so many amazing things like the Steel Magnolias remake. I love her in that. Um, you know, she she's one of those actresses you've seen so many times and I love her her hair in the yes. movie just do um but you see these three the dynamics of these women and i think it's so important because they 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 be, i think they believe her but they can only sympathize so much until you find out a little bit more from terry's character but i love that as the course of the film goes on you have the debates between them and their own pers they all have a perspective on rape they all have a perspective perspective on what Marjorie's doing because mm -hmm. she is being driven out of desperation. But that's what I love about Marjorie is that she never gives up. She never gave up in the car. Mm -hmm. She never gave up standing up for herself at the police station. She never gave up when he kept when he cat when he finally shows up 
Uh, she plays along. She knows when she can move or not move, but any chance she gets, she goes for it. Exactly. And then once, once the tables are turned, and I love a good table turning movie, once they're turned, she never gives up on getting that confession out of him. Good for her. And it's like, okay, so I love the fact that we see with this character, Joe, that he's stalking these women in the parking lot. And it's not like it's like an abandoned area. You know what I mean? Because most movies, they'll yeah. show, oh, there's no one around. No, the lights are still on at the ice cream shop. And then, you know, I know that some people can possibly say, well, she should have locked her door. It doesn't matter. He still would have attacked her, you know? So, okay. And and like you said, like, I, that's how I, I get so pumped when I'm like, run, run. Because, like, that's how I felt while watching it. It's just like, you cannot... Like, it just grosses me out, like, the thought of it, you know? But I I felt that she just clearly did not want to be in that type of situation. But she was scared for her life. And so when she got that opportunity in the car to run, she did. And she ran for her life. Then when we get to the police station, like you were talking about, it's just disappointing because it's just like, oh, you want a woman police officer? Well, yeah. So then she gets there, and then it's just like, what's the point of this then? What's the point of it? And this is me kind of jumping ahead. Just being honest with you, maybe she should have killed him. I'm not saying, I'm not saying I would. I don't know what kind of situation it would be for me, but it's just like at this point, it doesn't really matter. That's 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 what they're saying, you know. So I understand how she felt. And what I found another thing that I found really upsetting. Well, before I move on to the upsetting, let me talk about some stuff that I liked. I really liked her roommates at first. I liked their house. You know, it looked very peaceful. Yeah. They just looked like you can definitely see why they like why they're roommates. You know, they seem to all have like a connection. They have an understanding. They respect each other. You know what I mean? And they're open enough to like have like a regular conversation. So clearly she told them what happened to her. What I find insane is that, you know, I know it's only been a week, but no one wanted to be there with her. And I know they had stuff to do, but it's just like, I don't think that you should be at the house by yourself. They don't even have a dog. They had a cat. That cat doesn't care. And a bird and a goldfish. You know right. what I mean? So it's just kind of yeah. like, I don't, it's, it's, I'm not blaming Marjorie, but it's just, and, and I know she's a grown woman, but it's just kind of upsetting because, all right, you guys know as women, even if you never experienced something like that, she's your friend, you know? So even if you, even if you think that she's lying or you think that she's, she's whatever, has she ever done anything like this before? Like, they've seen her. They saw her neck. And then, moving forward, so I have to talk about what I did not like. The friends after a while. Because first, okay, when it comes to Terry, I get it. You know, this is like a, basically when, I'm sorry, I'm like jumping ahead. So basically, when, <laughs> when, uh, when Terry comes back home and Marjorie is digging a hole, digging a grave for Joe, she has Joe trapped. And like you said, she just kept fighting Marjorie. She fought for her life when he broke in pretty much. Well, John even broke in. He just walked right into her house. And there was nothing that she could do about it at that point. It, it, it didn't matter if she was nice, if she was mean. He, knew, he was just like playing with her, you know? So she finally was able just to get him in, in a particular situation where she kind of has him trapped in the fireplace. And, you know, Terry comes home and she's just like, you know, very confused and scared. Like, first off, the place looks a mess. There's a man trapped, you know, in the fireplace. His eyes are all messed up. Like, I mean, Marjorie really did mess him up. Like, she did a great job. Then Marjorie comes in. She looks battered. She's all dirty and stuff. Like, she was going through a battle. Bloody nose and all. So then, Terry, I get it. You, we didn't know fully her background. But as a viewer, she's just seen this. Sometimes people react a certain kind of way, right? I get that. But then at the end of the day, you let this man, just this random man you don't even know, bringing up stuff about a man that you're getting upset about. You know what I mean? Trying to pin her friend, her roommate, her long-term friend against her over a man and the fact that she believed him. Then at first, you know, Pat, like I liked Pat at first because when she came in, she asked something that Terry didn't really ask, which is just like, are you okay to Marjorie? Right. You know what I mean? And it's just like, that would have been the first thing. I'm not saying I would have been like, yeah, let's just bury him in the backyard. But she is, she's clearly, look at her. 
I don't think that she's in shock, but I think that she's angry. And I think that she's sick and tired of the situation that's going on. And he just, he even said it himself, you know, obviously before they came in, that you don't have any proof. And come on, ladies, you know that it's true. So, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just so much to unpack with this movie. But I love the fact that it, it, it starts a conversation for the viewers. You know oh, what I, I mean? Yeah. Starts a conversation where we can talk about the characters. We can talk about um, even with the character Joe. We can even talk about like the dynamics with the women. You know, would you even talk to these women afterwards? Like, I'm because all what Marjorie had to do just to get them to believe her. I saw her friends eventually getting on her side, but she literally, it just seemed like she had to like go through hoops for them to get on her side. But it's understandable. But that's what makes it like a good conversation. You know what I mean? I will say this. I feel like the when when she's attacked the first time and she comes home and then it says like a week later. So a week has gone by. I think it's supposed to be more of a commentary about how desensitized we are. Like even the parking lot and the fact that he could do this in broad, like not broad daylight because it is night, but the lights are on, the car is right. there. I don't think it's unrealistic. I think things like that happen every day that oh, it sure. happens in broad daylight. And I think that because of that, with the two roommates, with Patty and Terry, when they're like sitting at the breakfast table, I think they care about Marjorie. Mm -hmm. But I think they're thinking it's been a week. It didn't happen to me. It's she seems right. okay. She got away, which also becomes for uh, Terry's character later on a very important point is that Marjorie did not get raped, and Terry did get raped when she was young, mm -hmm. which is heartbreaking to hear. And I think right. that that's why she has such a she's she's kind of a flaky character. Uh, she's the flaky right. one of the three roommates. But what I mean by that is I think it's an act. I think it's. Her, she probably had a mental struggle when she was 17 years old. And in order to deal with it, she didn't deal with it at all. Like she said, she ended okay. up making it just a bad dream. So I think for her, mm -hmm. it's forcing her to remember this traumatic experience. So when she comes in later on, she can't handle it. She never. Okay. She's not like Marjorie, who Marjorie, this was her, I, I'm guessing her first experience with an actual attack on her as a woman, as somebody who's just trying to live her life. And she fought back and got away. But then, you know, she was she was vulnerable because he had her wallet. He had her address. She knew that there was only a matter of time. And I'm sure that Terry probably also was thinking about that in the back of her mind. I'm sure that Marjorie said that to her and just didn't want to deal with it. And you could see in the sort of cavalier attitude that Ta Terry has inviting the pizza guy in. And you could see that Marjorie's visibly upset that Terry is just letting this pizza right. guy come in, hanging out. And she kind of rolls her, like she's, she gives Pat a look and Pat just kind of rolls her eyes. Pat, meanwhile, I think, you know, she's a social worker. I think mm -hmm. it, it is her natural inclination to be like, are you okay, Marjorie? Right. Are you okay? It's her natural inclination, inclination to help this guy, even though he's, you know, the That's detestable. True. And I think that these three different women, so Marjorie got away again. You know, she goes through, she's mentally abused all afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like Pat says, all day, because he came right after they left, and this went on all day. Yeah. So Marjorie now has snapped. And I think mm -hmm. you say something interesting that, I think is a very popular opinion, but nobody wants to say it. I think if the two women didn't come home, I don't think Marjorie would have had any other choice but to kill him. You know, I what could he's she's right. Like yeah. she can't just like let him do anything to prove it. Like, how can you let him prove it? You know, like she, she right. can't prove it. And so the way that Terry comes in is from this, her brain is cracking, I think. She mm -hmm. is emotionally now like vulnerable. Pat's coming in. She's a professional. She probably sees women who are battered and domestic violence every day. So she's trying to take control of the situation. And meanwhile, Marjorie is 100% sure that she's right. And that's what I kind of love about the movie is that you have these three, they they each represent, you know, the man, uh, what's, uh, his name's Joe in the movie. Um, but he, you know, he represents rape. 
and you have mm -hmm. these three different societal viewpoints on what to do with a rapist. And that's what I think the dialogues. Now, I do think also, I, I think I see maybe a fundamental issue with the screenwriter, with because it was adapted from, I think his name's William Mastrom Simone. He wrote the mm -hmm. screenplay for this too, based off of his play. Now, in the play, the whole beginning didn't happen. So we're meant to think as the audience while he's playing these three different women off each other, like, hey, you know, Marjorie, Marjorie was with your boyfriend, Tony Terry, and that whole thing. Right. We're meant to think the way the play's written, we're meant to think, is it possible? We're supposed to doubt Marjorie. We just see the moment he comes in, he does attack her, but we don't know that they maybe had a history. So it's the fact that maybe uh -huh. she's lying in a way. So okay. we're meant to, at the end, come away with, oh my gosh, we I can't believe we didn't believe Marjorie, the audience. <laughs> but that doesn't work in the movie because in the movie, we, we have no doubt. We know what he did from the beginning. We know he was in the car because when he comes to the house, I think in the play, the line is, oh, you want to run to the door? Let's see who's faster. In mm -hmm. the movie, the line is, oh, you want to run for the door? Let's see who's faster this time. So yeah. there's... No doubt, we already know. So there's the jig is up. We already know that this happened. So I think that might be a fundamental issue of they maybe should have changed that slightly. But I think they really wanted to capture the keep the remaining idea of these three different viewpoints. And it it, it is sort of like one of those movies of what would you do in that situation? Um, I wouldn't say that this movie has a happy ending. But I will say that, yes, I want to know more. I want to know yeah. exactly how he was, uh, you know, punished, what happened, et cetera. But I do think that there is a sort of resolution to the fact that they get a confession out of him, which was, you know, now we know, now he had, now she has witnesses. Right. And, you know, the way I did want to say this last thing, I can't understand, I could understand Terry's doubt, even coming into the house and seeing it in a mess. Because Terry saw the, the night before when they were eating supper, how she was, how Marjorie was with the pizza guy. They mm -hmm. may have thought, you know, Marjorie is wanting a gun. Marjorie is kind of getting really paranoid, rightfully so. Mm -hmm. But from their perspective, they might think she's starting to lose it a little bit. So it could kind of come in like, oh, maybe Marjorie did attack this random guy. Right. Maybe Marjorie did make the house look like this because she needs somebody to blame. And I think that's brilliant, kind of, because mm -hmm. that happens every day that we blame the victim. Every day. Every and day. so I think, again, and that's become such like a, um, you know, with the whole Me Too movement to mm -hmm. say, hey, you're not alone. Hey, we are victims too. Hey, we went through this. This was 1986 and this was yeah. going on. They, they mentioned that in this film. The play was 1982. So clearly at some point we got to do something better. But anyway, I just wanted to kind of respond to, I don't disagree with anything that you said. Right, um, right. I did just want to add a layer of clarity that I think the screenplay originally for the, the play is written that we are, we don't know exactly the whole, we do see him attack her. We mm -hmm. see them struggle, but it, it pretty much starts, oh, it's like 10 minutes in that she's turned the tables on him. And, and in the movie, that's the midpoint, you know? Right. So I just want you to have that context. But uh, were there any, did you want to respond to that? Well, or did you want to move on yeah, to anything? Yeah, you know, um, with the characters, like, you're absolutely right. I didn't think to think that when it came with Terry, that she was clearly, she can't handle it. And you I don't want I mean? to interrupt, but to be fair to you, I've seen this movie so many times. Right, right. So I'm going to know a little bit more of the dialogue in the words. Right. So I just, I want to be fair to you to say. No, no. You know, no, this is your initial impression where I've, you know, I've been able to watch it so many times. Right, but I, I feel like you're right because they, when she does reveal that she was actually sexually assaulted, you know what I mean? And then it's just like, she does seem a little bit unhinged compared to Marjorie who went right. through a whole afternoon, a whole day through this. And you're also right when it comes with Pat because she's a social worker. They mention it a couple of times. She is that calm and cool collective type of one, even when they were eating breakfast together or, or dinner or whatever. And then it's just kind of like she was just fine just sitting back with the guy coming in, just letting people be who they are. So you're you're definitely right about that. I guess, though, like with, with my thing, too, I guess I didn't also look at it in a way where it's just like, OK, maybe she is. Maybe they did think that Marjorie 
was getting a little bit loopy, you know, not really being herself since she wanted the gun. They could hear her up at night. But that kind of also furthers my point where I thought it was weird that they left her alone. Like, I don't think that it's a, it's a plot hole. I don't think it's like, oh, the writer. No, it's just kind of like a thing where it's like, kind of like what happened at the police station. It's just a little bit upsetting. You know what I mean? Where it's just kind of like, maybe we shouldn't leave her alone. Like, I know that it's, she's a grown woman. I know it's a week and I know I have to go to work, but it's just kind of like, Maybe you should go out. You know what I mean? Get dressed, go to the mall, go for some coffee. You know what I mean? Just get out of the house. Um, but yeah, but that's that's kind of what I like about it because not that I always like to watch upsetting movies like this, but it's just like, like I agree with you because the ending isn't happy, but it does make you have, again, a conversation. It makes you want to see more, you know? And, but in some ways she finally, because she kept on fighting Marjorie, she finally has proof and she has yeah. witnesses you know but again like you said it's just unbelievable where it's just kind of like this was made in 1986 and we're in 2021 about to be in 2022 and this kind of stuff still kind of happens and the fact that he felt that he could do it in a it was a pretty crowded parking lot then he yeah. did it in daylight you know <laughs> like he has no remorse and then even when it comes with the character joe i kind of want us to touch on him that's insane to me. And it's like, okay, not that I was like checking him out, but it's just kind of like, he's a normal looking guy. You know what I mean? So, and not saying that you can't be normal. You get what I'm saying, yeah. but it's just kind of like, okay, what's, what's wrong with you? And then even when he reveals with what his wife says, and he just kind of has like this breakdown, but it's like, what happened to you to yeah. make you want to go around to attack women and how many women did you attack before you know like it's again like i feel like it is just such a movie i feel like we could just have like a whole conversation on absolutely but yeah what what are your thoughts on joe well i think it i think you've touched right on it i think it's an interesting character because you know we don't know a lot about him but we learn just we learn as much about him than we as we do everybody else and it wasn't just a whim that he went to go rape some woman or some young girl he's a serial killer we kind we come to find out by at the end of the movie which again even though this is you know like a drama thriller i place it into the horror genre this is real life horror this is you know in, in a different way the megan is missing the sort of these things happen yeah. every day and this guy is a serial killer he confesses to what he was he planned on raping and murdering marjorie raping and murdering terry pat and then confesses to all these women at this point he's a serial killer and he has a pretty normal life he has a wife we see his daughter at one point saying daddy come in for dinner and that's very true to i don't know if they were doing a profile of serial killers how much they did in the 80s at this point but that's pretty spot on to what we've learned about we you know we you and i've touched on this in copycat or some other movies we've talked about you know serial killers he's he's definitely that profile you know the the white mid-30s guy you know that's the profile has a wife family the sort of front life and then going off and raping and murdering these women and he's sadistic um yeah. he doesn't you know tie her up and you know burn her with cigarettes or just he goes mentally abuses you know he mentally abuses her he's like go get me a beer and then smacks her do you think i'm stupid here put right. this on say thank you you know yeah. he like he's controlling and it must imply i think that means because typically when it comes to rape uh, there's a school of thought that it's less about sex, it's more about power, and I agree with that to an extent, and that's demonstrated in this movie. It's more about power for him. At first, I think it's sexual, but it becomes about power. He wants to, he knows this woman, she got away from him, so now he's, like, focused, you know, he's going to get her, and he is a he's a good looking guy and again it sort of breaks that stereotype because i think before in horror or in film cinema history you know it was always these sort of deformed guys right. or the dregs of society or something to go that you know this again he's not like a yuppie charismatic guy but he he has some charisma and yeah. it seems like a regular guy um you know if he wanted to if he just wanted sex i'm sure he could go have an affair on his wife type of guy like he would find somebody, but
But no, he wants to hurt them. He wants to dominate them. And I just think that's terrifying. I think he's smart. He's a probably, and that's probably a part of the, part of the problem. He's probably hit. He's got like a sort of accent that makes you think he's, you know, maybe middle class, lower middle class. And he's probably hit the ceiling of what he can get in life. So now he wants more power because he's probably been denied it in other aspects of his life. Right. And again, I just think it's it's not, that's not all said. It's not all done. It's just mm -hmm. in the fabric of this movie, which I do think is well-crafted. I wish that maybe they'd spent a little bit more time separating the play to this film adaptation because I do, when I watch it, the stuff that you talked about, I don't disagree with, I think, but I think happens because of the screenwriting where you are sort of like, why is this character reacting like this? And I think they really did want to hold on to, we want these very specific viewpoints, you know, of rape, um, which of course, from an academic perspective is great. However, in terms of the realist realism of the movie, you have to suspend your disbelief a little bit. Um, right. But again, those are my thoughts. What, do you, what else do you think, though, about James Russo? Again, his performance is great, just as great yeah. as the women. It, it, his performance is amazing. I was actually going to, um, well, like, like you, it's like I would, I would have wanted to know a little bit more about him. I kind of like sure. that there's a mystery, but just because I'm nosy and I want to know more, I want to know more about him. Like, okay, what was his childhood like? What's his relationship with his parents or siblings? And then even as far as it goes with his wife, I wonder what kind of woman she is. I mean, clearly she doesn't suspect a thing. You know, he was I'm... probably like in, in, in a garage or in a shed and doing guy stuff. I don't know, you know? So she probably doesn't yeah. think anything of it. When I see Joe's character, he seems charming, like he could be charming. Because at yeah. first, when he came into Marjorie's house, it was just kind of like, all right, well, you can leave, you know, type of thing. But he, he seems harmless at first. So, it, like, clearly just a completely different guy from the first time we saw him at night, clearly, you know? Right. And then he just let it all, all come out. But, yeah, I'm just, I'm not too sure what kind of wife he's with. Not that it's her fault. I'm just, I'm curious. Like, do you think he settled for her? Do you think it was just more of a... Sometimes I heard, like, when it comes to, like, serial killers or... You know what I mean? They like to have... They like to upkeep a certain image to make yeah. themselves look a certain way. So I wonder if that's how it was with him? Oh, I'm sure it was. I think that, you know, he's probably married to, to a woman who very much wanted that traditional life. And I'm sure he knows within himself he's not a traditional person, but he needs to buy into that life in order to have this other life. Or he may have earnestly, sincerely tried, and it's not working, and he needs right. to go have this this other double life where yeah. he cruises around in his Mike motorcycle, you know, being a predator to these to these women. And yeah, I think. All the characters are interesting, and I do think that bodes well for the movie that we are curious more about. I'm just as curious about Pat's daily life as I am Terry's or right. Marjorie. Like, that's the thing. Are these are three dimensional characters? Mm -hmm. They they sort of fit. They have their perspectives on life, and you you can you can kind of carve them out as this is who this type of person is. This is who this type of person is. But they each have depth. Pat, for instance, she's definitely, she's a social worker, she's caring, but you can see a few times where she's like keeping an arm's distance from Joe's character where she's, she doesn't want to fall for it. She also has her judge, judgments, but her whole life is about not judging people. So you can right. see that sort of struggle within her. Or again, like we talked about with Terry, that she doesn't want to deal with any of this and she is sort of a follower, you know, Marjorie's a leader, Pat's a leader, Diana's, Diane Scarwood's character, Terry, is not. And that, again, is the interesting part of these dynamics where we want to know more. But again, overall, I just love the setup of the movie. I love that you have this horrifying beginning, then it's, it's leading to the second half of the film where you are sort of going through this life, you're, this woman's life, where you're like, how, you know, this is going to go badly, going to go badly. But I love that moment where, like in the car, where she turns the tables on him when she she seems like she's going along. I love you. I want to make love, but she's reaching yeah. for that insect spray can. Mm -hmm. And the moment she gets it, I love the music, the energy yeah. there, where she wraps him up and kicks him in there. Oh. And I love that. I love the way she, Marjorie talks to him, like animal ripped it out of the court. She refuses yeah. to like 
you're, like she's now making him an it. She's making him a, an animal, yeah. a beast, something not human. Because to her, he's not human. And I love the moment where she's like, "Talk again, and I'm gonna bash you like a bug." And he <laughs> accidentally asks a question, and she takes that shovel and just bashes yes. his leg in. I like it's I, that's the primal part of us where we now have put ourselves in Marjorie's shoes that we are feeling her vulnerability that now we want to feel her strength and I believe yeah. extremities delivers on that again the movie title itself I think is very interesting it's going to the extreme of something but it also can mean like your appendages or things that can be cut off and I get a mental image of something of his being cut off which she threatens by the end of the yeah. movie if he doesn't start telling the truth. And mm -hmm. I like that sort of double entendre that that it could go either way. Uh, but again, overall, I just think there's a lot to celebrate with this movie. I think it's thought provoking. I think it has a great energy and each of the cast members really, really does a good job. It's not the best movie I've ever seen, but for an 80s thriller, I think everybody, should, it's a good, everybody should give it one good watch. Even if you haven't seen it, like, I feel like you should at least watch it once because it is like, it's an awesome 80s thriller. And no, it's not gonna be for everyone, but it is one of those movies where you can watch it alone and you can still be like, ah, oh, but you can watch it with a group and you all could just be screaming. So that's something that's great. And uh, again, like, it's just, really great storytelling. I love the way things unfold. You know, I feel like this movie will have you feeling all types of emotions. You have these really great performances that, yes, like you said, come together to tell a story, but it is also a story about how we are, we become desensitized to these things that somebody can be violated in public as well as in their home where they should feel safest. They're not at all, but I love that this one woman, she transcends from a normal everyday woman who is put in a situation of becoming a victim, who fights back again and again until she comes out on top. I love that you said that, because that's a good thing too. And I feel like that's something that's kind of different is that she, you know how like in the beginning, she's like, oh, ah, I'm scared. Like, of course she was scared, but it's like, she always had that strength. You know what I mean? Like yeah. she never ever just like, okay, just going with the type of thing. Of course, it was shocking at first, but like you even said earlier, she fought every single time. So that's just, it's awesome. Wow. But in a more, <laughs> I think people should check it out. Check it out, people. You will love it. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us for another episode of The Rabbit Dog Child, where we like to discuss lost and forgotten horror gems with a little bit of bite. Thank you, Zena Dixon. You can find her over at realqueenofhorror.com under her Real Queen of Horror moniker on YouTube or over at Wicked Horror. And I'm Justin Steele. You can also find me over at Wicked Horror, 401 Pop Culture, or on Twitter at Wicked Horror Justin. Thanks, Zena, for coming on to talk about Extremities tonight. I had a blast discussing this thought promoting film with you. I had such an awesome time, and thank you for this recommendation. Absolutely, we'll see you soon. Have a good one.